Our, our beautiful voice there added that part where you were supposed to remain standing for me, but I greatly appreciate it. Welcome to San Francisco and welcome to your annual conference, Gear Up. What a beautiful crowd. It feels like a movement in here, doesn't it? On behalf of NCEP's Board of Directors and the Gear Up Advisory Commission, we really want to welcome you to what is a pivotal time in, in the history of Gear Up, in this country, really, and moving forward. And, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. Uh, but we are so excited to have you. Uh, some of you we saw last year in DC or in New York, even, but it, it's been two years since we've gathered here and, in many ways, occupied San Francisco. And uh, I want to make special note that we have uh, two Gear Up uh, program officers with us here from the US Department of Education, Craig Pooler and Monique Bolton. The reason, big hand. They've been with this event and obviously with Gear Up from the beginning, the US Department of Education. The reason it's so important this year and why we appreciate it so much, as many of you know, uh, the review process on the Gear Up uh, RFPs that were submitted literally start right after this event. So the US Department of Education is knee deep in preparing and by September dispersing $66 million to Gear Up communities around this country. Oh. But that's right. $66 million, and what that translates into is, is more students being served, which is really critical, our mission, more students being impacted. So before we really dive into uh, you know, deep reflection, learning from each other, I wanted to just hit on this conference theme for a second. If we can just pull up the slide uh, of the theme for Becoming Future Proof. Becoming Future Proof. This is why it's so critical. You know, I was trying to figure out how to, how to put it in context without putting too much of a context on it. There's an old saying that says, uh, may you live in interesting times. You've all heard it? So I looked it up to find out what the origin was, and people don't really know. But oftentimes, it's, it's tribu attributed to an old Chinese, uh, Chinese saying. But what was interesting when I read it was that many people think it was actually part of an old Chinese curse. Yes. And why that was is because they believed that if, there was, if things were too interesting, there would be too much discord, too much conflict in society uh, for the good and the balance of the society. And I think as we enter into this conference theme of becoming future-proof, we can certainly say one thing that we are living in some interesting times right now. And there is m no more important thing to insert into these interesting times than gear up the values and the collective impact of gear up. So if we can put that slide back up and just keep it up there. So why did we pick Future Proof? We picked it for a number of reasons. One, because essentially, all of our business, all of the educators in here are about ensuring that students have the capability to, to navigate the future, which is rapidly changing. It's, it's complex from workforce to other issues, societal values. Our students have to be prepared to navigate that. At the same time as professionals, we have to be equipped to navigate that future. We have to upskill ourselves constantly. That's what this event is about. And finally, as a movement, as a movement, we have to become future-proof. We have to continually improve and excel. We have to rely on data and research to improve and to prove our efficacy under our prove agenda. And we have to mobilize as a movement. That's why when you stand up and make that noise, the unity behind that is what sends a message. How important of a message. In this country right now, some of the things that we all stand for, well, they're getting deprioritized. There's a competition for 66 million going on starting tomorrow. 66 million, that represents a $17 million increase from Congress this year in the 2017 budget. Increase at a time when everything is getting cut. Can we just keep that slide up here for a second? Thank you. 
So why? Why the increase? What we've done in this conference is this. We've tried to attach the value, the value proposition that are historical in this country to the ability to change and adapt to the future. The Statue of Liberty. It represents opportunity, hope, aspiration for all. No matter where you come from, no matter what your circumstance is, your ability to achieve if you work hard. It's the foundation that we have to move forward with because it's the same foundation for gear up. At the same time, the aspirations as we launch these doves of all our work, the aspirations for our students, we have to change. We have to understand what the future is going to look like to be able to manage that for our students, to equip them. The fire is critical. I made a speech here a couple of years ago about how angry I was about the pace of change. We have to all burn with a fire to change what is going on in our societies, to fight against the things that we don't believe in, and to enhance the things we do. And finally, at the base of this Statue of Liberty, I made a joke yesterday in a meeting where I said, if you look very closely at the bottom of the torch, you will see a gear. People believed me. We put the gear in, because in this room, we believe that everything this picture stands for, that in becoming future-proof, gear up and everything it stands for is the foundation, the core of that, which is how we've organized this conference, the plenary themes. Now, before we go any deeper, I have some very deep thoughts to share with you in a second. We need to kick this off, and we kick it off in a usual, usual tradition for the last 17 years, and we call it the roll call of the states. Because the most important thing about what's in this room is all of you. Your pride and enthusiasm about where you come from and your communities. And before we kick into it, all these events and with many of your work, you know, we can't do this without, without sponsors and, and corporate partners in the field. Uh, today, I just want to bring up quickly one of our key sponsors for the event, but really an enduring partner for, for NCEP and Gear Up for many years. Uh, ACT uh, supports a lot of what we do and works with many of you, but you know, in many instances, including our evaluation consortium, they've been uh, providing tons of in-kind support for many years to ensure that we have the right kind of data to be able to fight the fight we need to fight. Most recently, we've joined hands with ACT in infusing their holistic framework into our career and college clubs program, which we hope to get out to everybody this fall. And so we're really excited uh, to have an NSEP board member and longtime champion for Gear Up, Lisa Brady Gill. Thank you, Ranjit. Appreciate the kind introduction. Good morning, Gear Up. Wow. Good morning, Gear Up. The maniacal passion and commitment you exhibited during that roll call certainly tells me that you are ready to gear up for the demands of the future, right? Correct? Is this true? Come on. It's my pleasure to welcome you this morning, and I promise not to take the time I was um, so kindly allotted because this is a morning of celebrations and celebrities. And water bottles that you are not allowed to throw this morning. So, so we'll keep them up here. By its very nature, Gear Up was really started uh, to ensure that all of our students were ready for college success. And in the last 17 years, you all have done a fantastic job through this, mo through this movement and ensuring that's so. You've done that like no other movement or program or initiative in the nation. And so give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> so we're, the theme is future proof. And so for 17 years, you've been ensuring that students are ready for post-secondary. And how do we know that you've been ensuring that and doing 
above and beyond what the U.S. Department of Ed statistics show us that's the case. And in FY17, you all, through all your advocacy, your mobilization, and through all of NCEP's work as well, ensured that there was a $17 million increase in appropriations when we all know, sadly, other education programs didn't receive such an increase. And so th these are two things that show us evidence that you are doing your work and ensuring that students, low-income, first-generation college-going students, are ready for post-secondary education. However, we know that a movement like Gear Up has work to do, and we're all in this room together as change agents and champions to ensure that our students are not only college ready, but they're career and life ready. And so I'm really looking forward um, with my colleagues from ACT to, to be along for the ride with you as we do that. Um, ACT does join in this movement. We want to support you and we are supporting you. There's more we can do as well and we commit to do that. But let me just tell you a couple of things we're doing um, along with you in this movement towards future-proofing um, our communities. Most recently, we have partnered with NCEP's College and Career Clubs to redesign the college and career curriculum and design a research agenda around it to prove um, to, to make sure that it has empirical data around it. The, the curriculum is framed around ACT's holistic framework um, that engages students in activities designed to further their understanding of the knowledge and skills and competencies that they're going to need for college, career, and life success. There are five domains in that. You can read more about it. But, um, but we're really pleased to be partnering with NCEP and the College and Career Clubs uh, in this endeavor, and I think you'll hear more about that here at the conference. Um, this marks the one-year anniversary of ACT's Center, to, Center for Equity and Learning, and the center was created to close equity and opportunity gaps for low-income students and partners with many, many organizations and initiatives around the country, uh, College Promise Campaign, Make Better Room, uh, it also supports many research initiatives, uh, supporting working learners and closing those gaps. We offer fee waivers um, for all of your Gear Up students, and we also support English language learners, all 4.4 million of them in the country on our exams. We're also supporting a research base around dual enrollment because we know more of the students that we serve are seeing success in these programs and they're really helping them in communities, rural communities, urban communities around the country. And because our mission is helping in education and workplace and life success, uh, we're updating our workforce solutions, the National Career Readiness Certificate. Lastly, I wanna mention that, um, well, two things actually, the CCREC um, initiative that we've worked with you all for seven years is in year five. And we're in the process of pre preparing a field study that examines the impact of gear up on academic growth between middle school and high school. Um, you all are here as the only community that I know of, and I think most of us in this room know of, that is doing what you're doing. And so that's why we're here is to support you. We also at ACT um, have a, a learning network called ACT State Organizations in April Bell. Where are you, April? April. April was part of the ACT State Orgs uh, for, for quite a few years. And this is where we um, gather over 10,000 professionals and educators in states um, to really understand what you need and help you learn together through webinars, through professional development, through lots of policy updates, and through lots of networking. So we know you're the change agents. We know you're the champions. We're here to cheer you on. We want to be here to support you um, as you help your students become career, college, and life ready. Um, it's been a great 17 years. I know I've worked with this movement 
since the early 2000s, and I can't wait to see what the next 17 years bring as we upskill our students and really ensure that they're ready for what's next, and so they're all successful. The agenda today, tomorrow, are amazing as we bring um, motivating professionals and, and speakers that really are gonna help us do what we need to do. So thank you for allowing us to be a part of this and keep doing what you're doing. Um, call on us at any time, thank you. Okay, we couldn't do it without corporate partners and sponsors and there's many in the room and we thank you for your support for our communities and our students. So let me do this. I've got to make some very brief remarks to kind of set this morning, set, set this conference, and introduce our keynote speaker this morning. And I know you all are excited to hear from him, as am I. So I thought about what to say, as I usually do, and I just want to tell you I don't have my ladder with me this year. For all of you from last year, I didn't bring any of my garden tools. I thought about what to say. It's just me this time. I don't have a prop me at my most vulnerable in terms of what I wanted to communicate. And so here's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about, personally, what happened to me at the intersection of inspiration and exhaustion. All right, it's an interesting place. So two years ago, I came on board, came back to NSEP and gear up as the president, and we convened here. And the energy in this room for three days you know, your connectivity to each other, but your connectivity to this value proposition that all students can achieve and should have the same opportunity, no matter what, is just so inspiring. At the same time, when you're here and you leave after three days, man, I was exhausted. Tired, inspired, and exhausted. So I got on a plane to go back to DC, five hour ride, and as you all know, I, I, I talk about it when I speak, if you've been to one of these events before, you know, I listen to a lot of music. And so on that plane ride, you're so exhausted, you don't really have much room for any kind of real deep cognitive productive work. So I listen to five hours of music, five hours. But what happens in that, that, that intersect, that Venn diagram of exhaustion and inspiration is by the third or fourth song in, I start taking notes on my iPhone in the notes page. Weirdly, I start writing down potential themes for the next year. All right, this is like a couple of hours after. And so, two years ago, I left San Francisco. By October, when we start thinking about it, I had notes pages. You know, most of the potential themes and songs and stuff, you know, they, they, they don't see the light of day. So the same thing happened this past year after the last annual conference. But here's where I met my most vulnerable because it's been a strange year. I, was, I got worried about myself. In October, I looked at my notes page. I had reams, lines and lines of conference themes and songs that kind of inspired it. What started to get me worried is that the conference was in DC last year. I live in DC. There was no five hour plane ride. I have been accumulating inspirational songs all year in my notes page. Now here is what really started to kind of worry me. They were all love songs. <laughs> love songs. There's a line in a song by a band called The XX, and it says, I've been a romantic for so long, all I ever hear is love songs. That's how I felt. Right now, I know what you're thinking right about now. Stalker. <laughs> I thought about it. Can one person actually stalk a movement? The law here is a little vague. <laughs> Let me give you an example. If we could pull up the first slide. Here's a line. I'm not going to play you these because we have so much momentum in this room. These are like achy love songs, real love songs. Can we pull up the first slide, please? Here's a line from a singer called Keaton Henson. This is like singer-songwriter stuff, acoustic. It's achy, like he's writing about a, a, a woman he loves and what happens if they're not gonna be together. 
And there's a line in it, it's a three and a half minute song, like right at the end, and it says, if you must work, work to leave some part of you on this earth. So I'm, on, I'm listening to this song, it's called You. It's all about this woman that he loves. I see this line, I think, gear up. <laughs> this is what they do. Their legacy, their enduring legacy of intergenerational change, that's what you do. So I thought to myself, I made a note, if you look at my notes page, get in contact with Keaton Henson, Keaton Henson and invite him to play the song here. What's really bizarre is I do that. I look him up, he's English, lives in London. Unfortunately, he's a beautiful artist, by the way, a poet. He's, he he, he uh, is stricken by severe anxiety. He rarely plays in person. And when he does, it's like in small churches, small groups. I thought the roll call would just freak him out. <laughs> but it kept going. Here's another one, if we can get the next slide. Leonard Cohen, classic, classic poet and songwriter. Here's the line. This song is called Anthem. Ring the bells, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. I heard that, and I thought, man, in our society, there's a lot of cracks, fissures. I saw Gear Up. The Gear Up professionals pushing the light through the imperfections in our society. So I thought about it. Unfortunately, Leonard Cohen passed away a couple of years ago. So he couldn't be here to sing to you. But what was getting troubling to me was every song, every love song, every achy song, I saw gear up. I know what you're thinking right about now, restraining order. <laughs> but what really freaked me out was this, it moved beyond music for me. If we can pull up the next slide. So I was in San Diego with our DLI, District Leadership Institute, and I walked into a, a store that was selling reproductions of art. And this was hanging on the wall. How many people have seen this? Okay. This is a, this is a uh, work of art by an anonymous graffiti artist or guerrilla artist named Banksy. It's called Rage or Flower Thrower. I walked in, and I stood there, and I saw gear up. You all are revolutionaries in terms of demanding change. But instead of throwing hate and destruction, you're throwing flowers. Care, love, the connectivity between all of us in society. I bought this reproduction. It sits in my office. But I saw gear up. I thought, hey, maybe after this conference, we could all get on LinkedIn and change our titles to flower thrower. Troubling, right? That's been the story of my year. And why is it so important? I have to understand it. I'm going to try and fly through this. So I wanted to understand what was wrong with me so I could heal. Here's where I came to. The next slide, please. Here is my third grade classroom picture. I know. Which one do you think is cute? Is it me? <laughs> this is in Malaysia, where I grew up till the fourth grade. I am the kid in the far right corner, second. I'm the only white kid in the picture. <laughs> There's Chinese, Indian, and Muslim, Malays in that picture. So this is what hit me about why every song this year has been a love song and why it's for Giro. When I was in first grade and I showed up to school, you know, I didn't know white from my dad being Indian, my mom being English, never thought about it. I was sitting at the playground at the beginning of first grade, and these kids started picking on me. Like, to, not just bullying, like wanting to fight a first grader. The problem I had was this, is that his fifth grade brother was there, and their friends. So there I was at the beginning of school, first grade, like not knowing what to do. You know what I did? I ran. I ran to the other side of the school to the ball field where my fifth grade brother was. And he came back with me. And we stood there. 
Now, I can't remember what happened next. I'd like to say I kind of cleaned up <laughs> with my athletic fifth grader brother just watching. <laughs> that didn't happen, I'm sure. <laughs> the point is this. My brother Paul has been standing next to me as a champion multiple times in my life. Or my sister Julia on the other end when I needed the most. Or my parents behind me. This world needs champions. When I reflected on this picture, I then reflected on when I was a high school teacher in DC. There was a girl named Crystal that came to me, and, and Crystal got picked on a lot in school because of physical appearance. And she said, you know, Mr. Sadu, can I eat lunch in your room at lunch every day? Because, you know, I don't like being in the, in the cafeteria. And she would come in, and she would eat lunch, and she would just sit there every now and then we'd talk. She'd tell me something like, hey, Mr. Sadu, you know, I, I, I applied for a job at Pentagon City to be a hostess, you know, on the other side of the river where those kids didn't work. And at night, I would drive to Pentagon City, and I would go to that restaurant, and I'd be like, Crystal applied for a job here. I think you should hire her. I, I'm here as a character reference. She'll do great. And they'd be like, well, who are you? And I'm like, oh, I'm her high school history teacher. I should know about food service. She's going to be awesome. <laughs> and then another kid came, the immigrant from Africa. And the next, I knew it, I looked up, and there was a room full of kids eating lunch, champions of each other. You all, there's about 150 students in here. You are champions for a movement that represents 635,000 students a year. Shoulder to shoulder with them. It is critically important. So when we think about changing and adapting, there are some values that we got to push forward. We got to keep. And that's what you do best.